All right. Good evening, everyone. Special edition of Hellabass Live on a Tuesday night, bumping things up. We're into hockey season around here for my kids and my daughter. And so everybody's going to have to be on their toes in the fall and the winter here, whether it's going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or whatever, because uh, we're just going to have to make, make it happen when we can make it happen. But uh, we're here to talk fall, fall fishing. I think it's safe to say the fall fee bag is about to start uh, based on this past weekend. So tonight we have Chase Hull joining us. What's going on, Chase? Not a whole lot. Glad to be here. Awesome. Uh, make sure we sound good here. Brian says we sound and look good. As good as we can look for a couple of fishermen, I suppose. But uh, <clears throat> lots of familiar faces, several members in here. Awesome. So we're ready to roll here. Got people rolling in. Got some people hopping in for a non-traditional night. Um, Going to talk things all fall fishing and talk about some some big bags of bass that were caught this past weekend. <clears throat> and what's going on and then uh, a few other things. And I guess, Chase, I guess we haven't really met too much briefly uh Saw you at weigh-in with a just this big grin on your face right before weigh-in. <laughs> what was that all about? You know, it's hard. It's hard to hold it back. It's hard to hold it back when you've got a bag like that. But it's it's. I was still nervous. I still thought there. You know, I still thought somebody was going to come in with even bigger. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and <clears throat> have you ever weighed? We haven't talked about how big it was, but is that the biggest bag you've ever weighed? That's the biggest bag I've ever weighed in a tournament by far. By right. like a lot, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By at least five pounds. Nice, yeah. So if you don't know what we're talking about here, is Saturday with uh, with Banger, uh, we I fished and forty nine other boats fished a team tournament called the Minnesota Bass Heads. Oh, was there a the Battle of the Bass? The Battle of the Bass Heads, right? And it's kind of an interesting tournament. This was the third year. The first year I was ever able to fish it because the TBF National Semifinals always kept on falling on it. But schedules changed this year for the semi, so I was able to get in. It filled up in, what, three minutes? I, I think, think something so, like that. yeah. <clears throat> so back, the registration was back in May? April? April or May. Yep. I, wanted, I think it was right because when Brian and I were getting ready to register for our first tournament on the river, we had to send in like our entry like that day before for practice. So I want to say it was like mid to late April. For our tournament in late September, it filled up in three minutes. <clears throat> I think the north side filled in a matter of seconds. Yeah, so hopefully, Tony, if you're watching, you come up with some good ideas on how people that either finished in the top half or whatever get some kind of like like priority entry so that people that fish it get a chance to register before it opens up for everybody. So we'll see. Had you uh, fished it before? Or was this your first one? I, uh, I fished uh, all three of them. Okay. Fished nice. all three of them. I actually, I ended up winning the first one, finished middle of the pack last year on Gull and had one heck of a redemption year this year. Did you fish the, the all of them solo? Fished all of them solo. Are you just uh, not a personable person or just not like people or what's, <laughs> you, you know, some people would probably say that. Um, no, I just, if I can fish alone, I just feel like I focus better. I can get in that zone a little bit better. So if I can fish alone, it's just how I prefer to fish. Or do you just not, not like splitting checks? <laughs> no, it, it's more about the hardware than it is the money. The money's great. The money's awesome, but it comes and goes. But those those championship trophy belts will never leave my wall. So now you have four belts and only got, one waist. I've got four belts and one waist, but uh, uh, my kids love a couple of them, so they like to play with them. Do, do you them. happen to have one of those belts handy? Uh, if you give me a second, I can probably go run and grab it. We should probably show them what these belts are all about. Yeah, give me a second. Oh, what's up to everybody while we wait for uh, Chase to come back? Make sure we thank Arsenal Fishing for supporting the channel and this stream as always. Uh, we're getting down to the last few days here to use the current Omnia code on the screen uh, in the description below if you're listening on audio podcast only. Um, <clears throat> that sounds delicious. 
Fish in the Southeast, eating a homemade pizza and a DQ Blizzard and Hell Alive. I just had some tacos. We got we uh, smashed some tacos right before we came in. So, <clears throat> sorry if I'm stepping on anybody's lives tonight, but we had to uh, to make an adjustment for kids' sports schedules. So, what's up, Jim? Glad you can make it live. Well, just a few more days, Daniel, we'll have the new code. All right. Sorry about that. Right. He's he's back, folks. <clears throat> so show us show well, us what you get when you win Battle of the Bass Heads. Let me uh, get it in the camera right here. It's just like back in a trailer, you gotta go the opposite. <laughs> So yeah, there's the front of it. It's got a couple of nice things on the side there as well. And I mean, this thing's a real deal. It's full leather. Real grommets. It's, 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 it's high class. Yeah. But people in the chatter, uh, I think it's pretty cool looking. <clears throat> They're very cool. They are very cool. Nice. Not to mention 10 G's, right? That doesn't that doesn't that, hurt. That, that doesn't hurt either. That doesn't hurt either. That was very that was a nice payday. Yeah, so cool. So and we haven't talked about this. You weighed was it 27? 27.77. So 27.77 for five bass in on the border of Minnesota, South Dakota. Like so basically minnesota uh so we are talking north i mean it's straight west of minneapolis pretty much um so from a latitude standpoint we're we're way up north for most of the country like i don't think people realize how far north minneapolis is like we're further north than most of i think all of new york uh you know <clears throat> so i mean it's it's to get that i mean that's like lake fork <laughs> type you it's, know what i mean like it's uh, it's almost unheard of. It's almost yeah. I've kind of watched a few of the weights from the South Dakota tournaments in the past. And every time it's just like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, absolutely. So and it wasn't just you like, I mean, no, uh, to top to on a 50 boat tournament, 10th place was 23 and a half or something like that right around there to get a check. And I think 17 of the boats weight over 20 pounds yeah something like that I, it the weights were just insane I, I didn't even i didn't i didn't like i don't remember how many six i mean that big bass was six something <clears throat> um, big bass was just shy of seven i mean yeah. it, the scale hit seven for a, a, a split second there nice and what was your big one uh just under six okay so you didn't even have a six pounder i didn't even have a, a big stone giant so you I had all had, five to five and a half pounders. They were all good. Yeah. Kind of that all upper five, basically. Nice. <clears throat> uh, yeah. I mean, obviously down South, like Clayton says that you do have your dirty thirties and your, your 40 pounds, but usually that's because they've got an, a 10, 11, 12 pounder in there, you know, <clears throat> or, or, or two, right. They have like a, a 11 and a nine. Right. And then, you know, then they have three, five pounders to go with it or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's a special lake. Hopefully it stays that way for a while. People take care of it. Um, I think part of what makes it good is the wind protects it from time to time, right? Like there's, if that tournament, if we would have had that tournament on Sunday, we would have never had it. They would have not probably let us go out. <clears throat> no, there are, there are days where you just cannot go out there. It's shallow. So the waves get just brutal and there's nowhere to hide. Nice. So <clears throat> I guess uh, you've got a little bit of experience out there. How I mean, like you've been fishing it off and on for a handful of years. Yeah. So uh, we were talking earlier, I've got a hunting shack out in that area. And so I've been fishing it for the last kind of five or six years, always in the fall when I'm out there duck hunting. And so I've got, I've had a little bit of experience on the lake. Um, took me a while to kind of figure out how to, 
how to fish it. It's a different lake. Mm -hmm. It's not like any, you know, I'm a, I'm a Minnetonka rat. So I'm used to deep weed lines, rocks along the weed edges. And it just, it doesn't set up that way at all. Yeah. I mean like Minnetonka, right. Deep coontail bite might be 23, 24 feet. And I don't know if there is 24 foot of water, but in about two, <laughs> two puddles, maybe in that entire lake. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. I, I didn't think, I didn't see anything over about 15 feet. Yeah. There's, I think it's around 20 ish in a few places, but yeah, it's not, not much. Um, so how many days of practice did you put in this week? So this week I put in one day of practice. I was out there Thursday when it was nice. It was calm. You could actually get around and do some fishing. And I figured out kind of the pattern I wanted. I checked a couple spots and, you know, kind of figured out how the fish were setting up. And after that, I just gr ended up graphing. I mm -hmm. went around side imaging everything. I didn't even really want to fish much just because it seemed like on that lake, a lot of places you're only going to catch maybe two or three fish off of that spot. And so I really didn't want to burn it up practicing for it. So I just, I kind of figured out what I was looking for and then drove around the rest of the day looking for that kind of stuff again and just mm -hmm. mark spots, mark spots, mark spots. And then the day before the tournament, weather was kind of, you know, iffy, it was windy, people were bouncing around out there. I just, I ended up taking the day off and kind of gearing up all my stuff and just getting ready instead of really beating myself up out there, you know? Sure. Right. So did you, uh, I guess, did it go down on one spot or a series of spots or how, how did your... So I, I started on one spot that I knew I wanted to start on. Um, I had not fished it in practice, but just previous years fishing there, I knew there could be big fish there. And I uh, pulled up there and started catching fish right away, but they were small. And I like, they took, well, just for people, well, like, sorry, like, the legitimately small, like, you know, two pounders. Yeah. And so... I, you know, I, I just had that feeling or I knew in my gut that there were going to be big fish coming through there. And so I stayed there and it was, you know, you catch fish three or four and then it would go five or 10 minutes where you wouldn't catch anything. Then you'd catch another three or four and then it'd go five or 10 minutes with nothing. And then it kind of went in those waves. And with each wave, the fish just seemed to be getting a little bit bigger and a little bit hmm. bigger. So I was able to kind of milk that spot for almost two and a half hours. And after that, that's when I just started kind of running around and I was able to pick up, you know, again, I was catching fish all day, but, and it was a lot of four pound fish. So, you know, it sounds horrible, but at that point, those weren't really helping me. So when you, when you, after two and a half hours, what, what do you think your weight was? I was at about 26 pounds then. Okay, so you you had caught in a few five, several fives by that time. I got I I had a couple fives, but I still had a couple fours in the live well, mm -hmm. and I knew I knew I had a good bag, but I I definitely knew I had to get rid of those fours if I wanted a shot to win it. And so I I again I ran around to some of those spots that I'd marked that Thursday in practice, and they just you know they worked out there were fish on those spots. So even after I left my initial starting spot, I was still able to upgrade throughout that day. And so I mean, jigs, moving baits, like what was your, I'm a jig guy. I'm okay. a jig guy. And the, luckily that bite is, you know, right up my alley. And so when I get a jig in my hand and can, you know, catch fish consistently, I feel comfortable. I know I can mm -hmm. slow down, work the jig how I want to work it. And really, I can pull into spots usually after people and still be able to pull out a couple fish after that, too. Yeah. So I guess relative, obviously not asking for like your main area. Was it in the lower third, middle third or upper third? of the lake? <laughs> I would give it the middle third. OK. My main area was in the middle third. And then from there, I ran north. OK. So you I got kind of away from the crowds, away from the islands, to be fair to say. Um, to be, I, I've never, I just have never had good luck around those islands. I, I end up catching more drum than I do bass. Mm -hmm. So 
I don't I I avoided those places as much as I could. Yeah. And I think when you're out fun fishing, right, that's different. But sometimes in a tournament, those areas get pressured too. But <clears throat> yeah. so what would you say like your main depth zone was where you're getting the, the biggest fish? So I was kind of focusing on any of that rock that was kind of coming up from that, you know, six to eight foot up into maybe three foot. Okay. And it would have little patches of grass that were still left over, but it wasn't, it, they weren't, the, these rock piles weren't connected to the main grass that was still along the, uh, mm -hmm. the bank there. Okay, cool. Sounds like the one good spot that I found that I obviously should have spent more time fishing <clears throat> <laughs> or more time finding more areas like that. <clears throat> yeah, I had one spot in practice that was kind of sounded like that. It's kind of like a, a hump coming up off a flat, but it was like surrounded by five foot topped off at maybe two and a half, three foot and uh, had some good rock on it. It wasn't like anything crazy boulder wise, uh, but there was some grass around it and in practice i like shook six or eight off there and then i caught one that was like a two and a half and i was like well that might be this might be a waste of time so then i threw in there and i jacked the five and a half and i was like <laughs> but then in the tournament it never kicked out anything bigger than a three and a half so, <clears throat> so. And that's good that, i don't know that's the other they didn't really seem to be schooling by size out there uh -uh. i mean you'd catch a two pounder and then like you said your next cast you could jack a five and a half or a six Yes, David, you can always watch the replay on Facebook, YouTube, or search Halabas in your favorite podcast app and join the MP3 team. So, yes, they'll, they'll be there. Um, so, yeah. So, so were you throwing a football jig or like a grass jig or what kind of what's your, what's I mean, you might be as a jig guy, you must have a favorite type of jig. What, what's your uh... my favorite jig? It's hard to get a fighter jig out of my hand. OK, I love those outcasts. Uh, stealth fighter jigs so i was throwing that a lot i also had a football jig um tied on and then i also had kind of a smaller finesse jig okay so i'd kind of rotate between these three jigs and it and neither one of them seemed to be really doing any better than the others right but it definitely you know you'd throw that fighter jig in there four times not get a bite then you throw the football jig a couple times not get a bite and all of a sudden you throw that finesse jig in there once and don't you get one and it was all sure. the same rock so i and that was the you know it, the bites didn't come right away in a lot of places hmm. and i i don't know if that's just due to the pressure that the lake's been seeing recently or if the fish were just in a kind of a finicky mood that day or what but it you know a lot of these fish i'd cast at the same rock almost a dozen times before I'd finally get a bite. Is this true? Are you a spinning rod guy? <laughs> no way. <laughs> he calls my 893 a spinning rod. Uh, <clears throat> Colby, you're only about 18 minutes late, so you're not too far behind. You could, you could jump back on YouTube, put that 1.25 speed, and you'll be caught up before we're done. Oh, yeah. oh, cool. So awesome bag. Congrats. Uh, what would, uh, so what was the, the second place that they have? Second place was 26, 26 and a half, I think. So you're basically right at a pound. Yeah. So without like you would, you did not have it one after two or three hours. You definitely needed most of those last calls, maybe all, but maybe one of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I was able to make one last call at the, you know, my last cast of the day. I caught a 5.31 that was, you know, just over a half pound call for me. That got rid of my last four pounder, finally. And um, I don't think, again, I don't think I really needed that one at the end, but you always think you need one sure. more. It would have been you tight. You would have been sweating it. I would have been sweating it for sure. I was sweating it as it was. I mean, right. it. You know, this spring they had a thirty-pound bag that came. Wasn't in, it thirty-two? So. Yeah, yeah. So you it wasn't even like thirty; it was like thirty-one, or I mean, it was like yeah, <clears throat> it was a yeah, exactly. So you do, you, you just never felt safe up there. Did you like change up the trailers based on the type of jigs you were using, or? Yeah, I had a couple different trailers. Um, I like the rage, you know, the striking rage bugs. Um. 
I also went to more of like a cross style trailer for some of them. And then for the finesse jig, uh, uh, the baby rage tail or rage craw, whatever they're called, the baby ones, the smaller mm -hmm. ones. Sure. Craig says uh, straight floro. No, no. Straight braid? I, uh, braid to floro? I'm a braid to floro guy for just about everything. Okay. So what, uh, what was your setup for that? I usually, uh, almost on all my bait casts and stuff, it's going to be a 30 pound 832 suffix braid going to a uh, 20 pound Invisex uh, fluorocarbon leader. Okay. Every okay. once in a while, I'll bump it down to 17 pound if I'm in, you know, lighter stuff, but you basically 20? 20? Yeah, 20. That's a good, that's an interesting question. <clears throat> so what do you, what do you think? those bass were keyed on was it i think it was bluegills okay uh they could have been eating perch there's so much stuff in that lake baby uh, white bass baby drum yeah there's so much stuff but i uh i'm sure I there's see... shiners i'm sure i mean there's a lot of things in that lake i'm sure <clears throat> yeah but i i think that there were definitely there were bluegill fishermen around me a lot of the day and I did see a couple of them speeding up bluegills. So okay. I know I, I know that the ones that I was around were going after the bluegills. And this lake, <laughs> for you people that want to catch a 9 to 10, 11 inch bluegill, <laughs> this might be another lake that's on your bucket list. <laughs> yeah, they, they've got everything just seems to grow big in there did you guys catch any walleye while you were out there so i like i spent like what nine total days on that lake and i've never caught a walleye <clears throat> i flipped a log and caught a bass took it off flipped right back in got a bite and set the hook and i thought right away this is the one this is the one that's gonna seal it and it ended up being about a seven and a half or eight pound walleye yeah Um. Yeah, it's. It, it, I don't. I think the walleye population is overall down there, but it's still got good walleyes. You'll catch a fair amount of drum in areas, yes. sheephead. Um, it's got a big population. Of, not a lot of pike, which is a nice, a nice bonus. I mean, the, the ones that are in there are pretty good sized, but there's not a ton of them. I don't think I've ever caught one out of there. I think I've caught two or three in nine days of fishing which is it's a good ratio for where we live <clears throat> i didn't catch any white bass this time but they can be kind of fun out there too yeah well typically you gotta throw a spinner bait or a you know a moving bait that's a little more shat and then you'll catch them or <clears throat> you know a white swim jig or something like that they don't they don't tip i mean you will catch them bottom mounts in a jig every now and then but um I did on uh, the day you took off, there was some white or some birds flying in. So I went up there and threw my spinner bait in there just to keep my honest and <clears throat> caught a couple white bass and then moved on. <laughs> <laughs> Tony wants to know how many four pounders do you think you threw back that day? Oh, gosh. Honestly, I, I don't know, but probably. That's a safe estimate would be 20 to 25. <clears throat> I mean, at one, at one point I had my whole tank filled with four pounders. Right. And so I got rid of all those. And then there were, you know, countless other times where I was putting four pounders on the scale and throwing them right back. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd say a safe estimate four pounders is probably 20 to 25. Solid day. My problem is we only caught two four pounders and caught way too many three to three and a half pounders. <laughs> yeah. Again, I just, I, I don't think I've been on big stone where it's been that good of fishing for me. Mm -hmm. I've had days where I've had, you know, solid bags out there, fun fishing and this and that, but usually I go through big lulls and big stretches where I just don't catch anything. And on Saturday, I just didn't have, it seemed like everywhere I tried, I was at least catching a few fish. Yeah. And I knew if I could do that, I was eventually going to run in to the ones I needed. Mm -hmm. Jesse wants to know, how do you win two out of three? 
<laughs> I don't know. Big Stone is a lake that I have loved for a long time. It's very special to me. So the win out there was huge. Uh, the win on Lahamadu, man, I was just trying to compete in that one. I didn't think I was on anything good at all. And I didn't catch a big fish that day. My biggest fish was three and a half pounds. But every one of them ended up weighing that. And somehow it beat Tony, who had a six pounder that day. Sorry, Tony. Sorry, not sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, I don't remember the exact acres, but it's 26 miles long. And I think it's like basically a mile to two miles wide all the way up. Does that sound about right? Like the narrow that, parts are about a mile wide. The wide parts are about two miles wide. Maybe yep. a touch more, but. That sounds about right. Uh, weather wise, we had, uh, sun, no wind in the morning. Wind steadily picking up. It ramped up by about 10. Yeah, I'd say 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, it was pretty sustained till 3. And then the clouds rolled in 11 o'clock noon. <clears throat> so, that's honestly, it's it was right, yeah. pretty. I mean, it got windy, but it, for Big Stone, it wasn't bad, honestly. Mm -hmm. like the, only, the, nor, the very north third of the lake got a little bumpy. But other than that, I thought it, was, it wasn't bad at all. It, it was still fishable up there. Yeah. Um, honestly, pretty good overall fishing conditions. Um, John, no, we really weren't that close because it sounds like Chase mainly fished the upper two thirds. And I would say we mainly fished the bottom third. <clears throat> so. Uh, if it gets too windy out there, that lake can turn pretty milky too. And yeah. that, if, when that happens, that my bite just shuts off. I've never first traverse. I know some people have. The funny thing about traverse, which is the next reservoir up, is it's pretty much full of smallmouth with almost no largemouth. And Big Stone is the opposite. I've never fished traverse either. It's supposed to be fun. I know I've talked to Ron Mayer and he's had, you know, taken some days off of practice on Big Stone. Like, like instead of taking the day off the day before, he'll go up to traverse and fish smallmouth or something like that. So. So what's your what's your electronics setup? <clears throat> you got 360 front facing, just 2D and mapping. Like what's your? So up front, I've 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 got the works. I've got uh, Mega 360, and then I went with Lawrence's uh, Active gotcha. Target forward facing, which to be honest, didn't the 360 played a much bigger factor for me uh, on Big Stone. Um, the forward facing is there's, there's just too much other stuff swimming around in there. If you start focusing on that, you're you're chasing fish all over, and you're probably chasing a drum or so, big, big bluegills. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. The, the pie plate bluegills probably look a lot like bass on front facing sonar. <clears throat> a twelve inch, a twelve inch bluegill looks a lot like a bass. So I I was much more focused on my three sixty and looking for those better looking rocks. And it makes you helps you make that cast, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so that you know sure. that you're hitting what at least what you think is the juice. <clears throat> Anyways. Yeah, exactly. What looks good to me. Uh in the areas where you're catching them, did you notice a fair amount of activity on live or was there just a lot of activity on all your spots regardless? There was just activity on all my spots, pretty much regardless. Okay. Um Everything I pulled up to seemed to have fish kind of moving in and out, of, or I should say on and off of the rock piles. And I don't know if that was kind of what had to do with the waves action that was, you know, you were kind of seeing when you're catching them. But, yeah, you just see kind of a school of fish move out and then another one move back in. And, yeah, again, I couldn't tell if they were bluegills or bass or what they were. but Whites or walleye. Yeah, <laughs> you could at least tell that there was some kind of activity going on down there. Um, it was a little low, but not bad. Not not compared to a lot of our lakes. It's not. I think it was up almost compared to maybe last year. I feel yeah. like last year the boat ramps were a little lower, but I, I didn't think it was that bad. Yeah, I would say it's. <clears throat> it probably felt similar to what it looked like when I fished it last June, 
but it was lower than this May. But it was definitely up this May. Like in May this year, like all the little like pipes and little creeks, they were all flowing in when we were there in May. So oh, okay. Mm -hmm. What's up, Sobe in the house? Uh, why do you think genetics, big yes year class, big son are so strong? Has it been that way for a while? I have a cycle over the years. We were kind of talking about that in the pregame show. We're not really sure. Um, <clears throat> it's, and we're trying to determine, like, do we think it's peaked? Do we think it's already hit its peak? Do we think it could be still, as crazy as it sounds, still on the rise? Um, I don't know. I, 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 you know, kind of thought, you know, looking at starting to first hear about it like two plus years ago on the South Dakota, and they were catching these, you know, 23, 24, 26 pound bags. And I was like, man, wow, we better get out there before it's dead, right? Or before it's over. In the last two years, right? You're starting to see 27, 28, 31. Like, I'm not so sure. I, I think. Like the, the food, like we talked about earlier, the forage base is unbelievable. Um, the, we, from what I've heard, the bluegills in the last 10 years have absolutely exploded. Um, talking to a guy that lives on the lake, it was like, you know, five years ago, <clears throat> you know, they'd be, oh, there's this, you know, there's some brim beds here and people would go and flock and they would get like demolished, right? They would, people go and then like, pluck all those big nine, 10 inch males off these beds. And then the next year it'd be like, well, there's, there's a pot here and a pot here and a pot here that they'd go and fish. And now they're literally up and down the lake. Like you can't, like if you go there in June, you almost can't find, you can't almost can't go a block without finding a pad of bluegills that are just full of seven to 10 inch bluegills. So I don't know if the bass are on a similar trajectory there's definitely certain areas of the lake that have more fish, but there, like you said, like you in the past there was more dead zones. Now it feels like there's less and less dead zones. <clears throat> so I don't know if the bass are still like spreading their tentacles into that lake and tapping into its resources still. So I'm I'm not really sure. Um, it that lake changes so much too. I mean the weeds are different almost by monthly out there. So I. I, I you know how the weeds grow every year is going to make a difference, and yeah, it's just hard and, to tell. And you know, the the, was, the South Dakota side definitely has a little bit steeper banks, <clears throat> um, at least on the lower half. Um, it gets kind of similar once you get up further, I think. Um, but there's more grass on the South Dakota side. There's more protected water on the South Dakota side. So more of your traditional like spawning areas for bass more protected areas more kind of shallower flatter bays um so i feel like the bass probably got like their roots buried in there and that kind of gave them their foothold and now i'm starting to think they might just be like branching out like a little bit i could be wrong but um obviously we still need to take care of it right uh people go out there and start filling coolers with four pounders then that's <laughs> not going to be great um <clears throat> but I, yeah it'll be interesting to see um the thing is like being <clears throat> out in ortonville you know it's three hours from minneapolis it's probably three hours from sioux falls or right or what i mean so it's not like near <clears throat> a big metro area um there's not a ton i mean there's a few motels a few resorts but it's, you know, not like Mille Lacs where there's like surrounded by resorts and, you know, fishing charters and launches and that kind of stuff. So, I mean, not saying that people can't put pressure on it, but there's not <clears throat> the abundance of people out there. And then you have the wind, right, which kind of gives it a break every now and then that you can't be out there seven days a week, usually fishing on it. Um, so I think there's some things going in its favor. Um, but we'll see. Um it is a trip out there. And I mean, it. if you get blown off Big Stone, it's not like you're in that Mille Lacs area where you can run to some little puddle real quick. Right. There's, there isn't much else out there. Um, I don't think Big Stone is dangerous to navigate as long as you ease and kind of in and out <clears throat> of the five foot and less. 
if you're in like five foot or less, you should be careful. <laughs> if you're anywhere near islands or shore, you should always idle out until you get to start to see that break <clears throat> into six probably before you take off. Other than that, I mean, there's not a lot. <clears throat> Running up and down the middle, there's nothing. No, the mapping is pretty accurate. So if you kind of like set your shades that you're deeper than five foot and keep a safe distance and it, it's it's not bad at all. Where you get in trouble is when you're idling around shallow or between islands and you leave your motor down or you go to take off too early or do something silly. That's when you're going to gonna find the, the big stones. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the other place that like Okaboji is probably tossing out similar size bags to uh, big stones. So there's two lakes that are not terribly far apart that are kicking out some crazy bags. Um, this, You know, it's been talked about. Big Stone, I mean, it definitely meets the acreage requirements <clears throat> for like a, a Bass Nation TOC, which would be 80 to 100 boats. How do you feel it fished with 50 boats? I thought, you know, I thought it was okay. Um, in my starting spot, I had one... Uh, maybe two other boats around me but they were able to keep their distance and they still caught plenty of fish as well um it may be a little different if it was like a week or two before for like the team trail event where everybody's beating the bank and only beating the bank um being able to fish some of that stuff that was a little bit off the shore helped out i think because then people were at least able to you know there were a couple boats that ran out the bank while i was fishing out there Mm -hmm. and nobody got in anybody's way by any means pretty sure it's tuesday but <laughs> so yeah I, I don't know maybe and, and i guess if it's what did you think <clears throat> i mean we weren't i mean we did only I would say maybe one or two times in the tournament, we pivoted a little bit where we were going to go. But for the most part, we were able to fish where we wanted to, when we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we didn't catch, we only caught 19 pounds, so we weren't <laughs> on the right program <laughs> that, for that particular day. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, but in practice, I know, and I don't know if this was the deal or, you know, but like this, the, the seemed like, Every little bump out on the Minnesota or the South Dakota side had a boat on it for the first 10 miles. Practice with practice, and people got a little more aggressive in practice too. I noticed I, I had a lot of boats creep a lot closer to me in on practice than they did during the tournament day. But tournament day itself, I thought went just I, I you know, I thought it was fine again. I had. One other boat that was parked there on on the same rock pile or same stretch, mm -hmm. about as long as I was. And then another boat that kind of came weaving in and out a little bit. But other than that, once I started running around, I was able to fish everything else I wanted to as soon as I got there. Yeah, and I think it's uh, a little bit mentality. So up here in Minnesota, we're a little spoiled. We don't really know what fishing pressure is. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you traveled to fish regionally or down south ever, Chase, but like, I mean, they'll, they'll put 400 boats on it or 300 boats or two, 300 boats on a 5,000 acre lake down south. Like they'll, <clears throat> you know, like, um, so yeah, I, I think it could be now would if we had a Bass Nation TLC with 80, 90 boats, would people bitch and complain about it? Probably, but it could handle it. Like somebody would still catch them. Yeah, there would be plenty of people that would probably struggle. It, it would kind of depend on weather. If we had decent weather where it was 15 or less and people could spread out. But yeah, if it was blowing 20 out of the northwest, it could get a little tight real quick. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, no, the it would depend on the season, right? If the fish were spread out a little bit where you could catch them off the bank and you could catch them offshore, then I think it would be. But if it was a certain thing where they're like, you know, if it was like a bank tournament, or just offshore, then, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, like you said, it would be tough for some. I, I still think it could handle it, but it, it would be tough. Um, yeah, so uh, Jesse says, what else do you normally fish? <laughs> I'm a bass guy, so, I mean, as far as bass, 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 but I'm not. Like I said, tournaments, like what other, yeah. are you fishing any other circuits or? Uh, I fish the Champions Tour, and then I fish Denny's on uh, Tonka. Okay, so the Denny's Super 30s on Tonka and then the Champs Tour. Yep. And then so this I your first year in the Champs, or did you done it before? Or? Uh, third year in Champs Tour. Third year? <clears throat> yep. And then basically anything else on Tonka. Blackfish Classic, Minnetonka Classic, uh, any of those kind of random ones. Do you fish Tonka with a partner? Uh, yeah, I've got a partner, Johnny Warner. Okay. Cool. Well, we got almost a hundred people rocking on the the YouTube. Maybe if you guys are thinking about it, a few thumbs up, maybe we'll get uh, over a hundred here tonight live. Um, good to see everybody on Facebook and YouTube. <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't know. Any other, I guess, closing thoughts on Big Stone or your thoughts or. Uh, I just want to say thanks again to everybody that helped put the event on Tony Lee, uh, Jay Johnson, all those guys that put in the kind of the behind the scenes work, all the sponsorships that went into it. I know Swagger Tungsten was in there. Omnia. Yeah. Um, thanks again for a great event. Again, I, I love this event. I look forward to it every year. And it was awesome that it was on a, a lake that was pretty near and dear to my heart. That's probably going to be the uh, the the battle of the bassheads record for quite some time. I would imagine <laughs> that's going to be that unless we go back to Big Stone. That one's going to be or tough. somehow we hold it in Okaboji, maybe. But yeah, mm -hmm. well, there we go. That's partly in Minnesota, isn't it? I don't, I don't know if it actually does or not. I thought some little bay of it touched it. Maybe not. Yeah, I've never close been close enough, anyways. This has been asked a few times. People want to know what you do for work other than taking kids' lunch money in bass tournaments. <laughs> uh, right now, I do a little bit of guiding out on Minnetonka. Um, and then I'm fortunate enough, my wife's a real estate agent. So I get to play kind of stay-at-home dad while I've got two young kids. And nice. she's running around with her crazy schedule. So, uh, Water temps were, what, mid to upper 60s? Yeah, by the end of the day, it was kind of creeping up to 66, 67. Yeah. Which might have been lightly, slightly artificially inflated because, what, Tuesday was in the 90s here? And then it kind of cooled off, so. <clears throat> um, I saw a water temp at 59 this morning, so it's creeping down. Things are only going to get better here for a little bit. Yep. Before they just come to a screeching halt. Not ready for it. Not ready for it. So you got any other tournaments coming up? Uh, I've got the Arsenal Fall Brawl. I might see you there. Are you going to be in that one? Might be. And that'll be, it. that'll be it for me for this year. Then I'm hanging it up or doing a little bit of fun fishing until things really freeze over nice yeah so <clears throat> i wasn't out there for <clears throat> the team trail um so why i know you mentioned that you thought they were kind of bank centric for that tournament um why do you think the offshore bite turned on <clears throat> I don't have a good answer for that. I don't know if it's, I don't know if those fish are always there and just not really catchable with the weed growth. I know um, I didn't fish the team trail either. But, um, this was all kind of hearsay, but I heard the weeds were much thicker out there when they were out there. Hmm. And um, so again, I don't know if those fish were just there and you really couldn't get a jig down there cleanly to catch them or, or what, but for whatever reason, in the fall of the year, they just seem to migrate to those rocks out there. And if you can find those, the right, the, 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 again, the stretch of rock that I was fishing was 
probably a you know a half a mile or longer but there were just little sections of that sweeter looking rock in there and really so that's like a, that really sounds like a spot that i grasped but i didn't fish <laughs> 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 so again i i don't know if those fish are living there year round and you're just not able to really get anything clean down to them when the weeds are there and then the weeds from what i had heard had basically all but died off except for on the bank and everybody that you know seemed to have a shallow bite going into this with practice, those fish just weren't there for them. So, and I, I don't have a reason for that. You'd think they'd be moving up to the bank this time. Yeah, I was gonna say most most other lakes that I fish this time of year, it's like every day that goes by, the big ones are rushing to the docks and the wood and the. <clears throat> and where I launched, you I, you would not believe the amount of frogs that were at this boat ramp. Hmm. It was insane. So, I mean, I, you'd think they'd be up on the bank just ready to gulp those down. But for whatever reason, it seemed like everything had kind of pushed out a little bit. Yeah. And, and it's like, <clears throat> they might, you know, I think there's plenty of people that fish that lake, but I don't know if there's enough of us that have been out there enough to really understand all its intricacies. So I don't know if there could have been a juvenile white bass movement or, you know, it, or yeah. baby drum or something going on that we're not thinking of or putting two to two together where they've, you know, did something weird that the bass were gorging on or I don't know. Right. I, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's an interesting, interesting lake. I was kind of like, I, like, yeah, I mean, I had some decent, I was <clears throat> my practice kind of the way Brian and I split it. Brian was kind of going offshore and I was kind of hitting the bank and we were kind of just going up the South Dakota side in chunks and I was just throwing a chatterbait without a hook, and I was shaking off so many fish every day. Were you so, really? Yeah, I couldn't get a bite on a chatterbait to save my life out there. I mean, like I Thursday, I definitely shook off thirty plus fish on a chatterbait. Really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I mean, I I really had to slow down to get bit, and I was like trolling motor on seven or eight. Huh. <laughs> like. Not even, I don't know, but that definitely didn't uh, materialize into what it needed to be um, in the tournament. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, I really, I had to almost go as slow as I possibly could to get a bite. <laughs> David wants to book a guard trip. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I definitely do. I owe you one still. <clears throat> there you go. Now's the time. Things now are about to get good. Time. Yeah, so uh, bummer I didn't get to hang out and watch all the festivities, but <clears throat> we definitely knew we weren't in check range, and we had a tournament at Malconia, so we were like, man, we want to get <laughs> get down the road and get rigged before dark and get ready, so... Uh, so I didn't get to stick around and congratulate you uh, in person, but congratulations. Uh, Thank you. And uh, awesome. Yeah, so Waconia, man, we had some wind on Sunday that would have made Big Stone absolutely unfishable. And people probably would have been broken stuff and we probably would have had some dangerous situations. So glad that we got our tournament on Saturday. Um and uh, yeah, actually, one of the boats got swamped at the ramp on Maconia, and there was a whole big mess. And that lake's not that big, honestly. Maconia is it's a decent sized lake, but it's not anywhere near Big Stone big. So, uh, and the, the weights down there were 16 pounds to win and a whole bunch of nine to 12 pound bags. So it wasn't that exciting of a tournament. But we ended up third in team of the year for uh, the TBF team trail. So if anybody's looking for an 80-pound, 45-inch shaft Fortrex, hit me up. I've got a brand new one in box I'll make you a good deal on. So Jesse says uh, Boji had a fall off. Uh, is there Back an A-right? Oh. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that Boji could have been off on Sunday just because that wind, too. Yeah. So 
I thought about throwing a Minnesota rig on Big Stone, but I didn't. Have you ever played around with it out there? I haven't. I, for some reason, I my mind is just jig. Yeah, jig out there, but also with a rig. I just I'm always throwing those in smallies. For some reason, yeah. I I never think about throwing them at the green ones. And it might be, might not be. The one thing that I could see is that it might be good because there is a bunch of juvenile white bass and stuff in there, but it also might be a pain to throw because you might catch so many white bass on it that. Yeah. Or you might have the, to throw like a really big, like 4.3 or something on there just to keep the white bass from eating it. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. But it wouldn't be a bad way to catch them out there. But the the A rig's a little under lies in just because we can only throw one hook. So we see it on Smalley Lakes a little bit with the the Minnesota rig, but I don't think a lot of people leverage it a lot. And the other thing is, I mean, most of our lakes are bluegill lakes. And I don't know if bluegill lakes and umbrella rigs go hand in hand. Maybe more of us need to test it, but it doesn't particularly jump out to me as the deal. No, I, I'm usually throwing that when they're kind of foraging after some smaller baits. Yeah, or shad or mm -hmm. emerald shine. I mean, yeah, I mean, something smelt, things like that, which is most of our smallmouth lakes, not our largemouth lakes. Um, I do have this little box. And I don't know, I didn't talk to you about time, Chase, so if you've got to go anywhere, don't feel like you're being held hostage, but you're more than welcome to hang out and talk fishing as well, so... Um, this was kind of a last minute deal. I do have a little care package from my friend TK that I bought a new bait. It's kind of exciting. Um, so that'll open that up here in a little book, a uh, little bit. Jesse says they're fall transition at Boji Hard this week. There was a 25 pound bag, but second was barely 15. Uh, blade baits. You, you do blade baits at all? Not at all. <laughs> I know that's something I got to get into. Chase is um, like me. He throws the jig or he throws the jig or he throws the jig in the fall. Yeah, jig, jig, or a football jig. Um, no, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's big. When it comes to late fall, you know, right before freeze up, I'm either throwing a jig or a net rig. I've did that. I've just never, I know that blade bait bite can be you know amazing when you get onto it i just yep. never done it yeah i don't it's it's a small window to me because like i feel like the blade bait comes out when they won't need a jig anymore and then the week later it's frozen yeah you know like there's like two weeks when they've kind of shut the, basically what to me is when that water drops below 45 but it hasn't froze yet it's kind of the blade bait time and that's a some years a really short window here. <laughs> that can be a matter of day, like you've, uh, days, if that. John wants to know who got you into fishing. Oh, you know that would be go. That would go back to either my dad or my grandmother. Go fish for bluegills off the dock and bass for spring. Uh, bass in the spring and. My dad's a huge fisherman. He loves fly fishing. He's not a big bass guy, but he would definitely be the one that kind of got me into into angling, you know, in the general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. <clears throat> so this is a bait that I've been eyeing up a little bit. And I finally pulled the trigger on it. So former guest. Tacklecraft TK Stanley. This is actually a handmade custom bait. So he, does, he pours these with resin. Uh, so they're all one of a kind. And then he does custom paint. So his big thing is he does custom paint, but he's getting into making his own baits. So it's uh, kind of got his own custom packaging there with this Tacklecraft logo. Looks like there's something. Oh, look at that. This is unexpected. This is pretty cool. Let's take this out before we get to the bait. He sent me a shirt, which his wife actually custom screen prints. 
Sorry about the plastic and the microphone. You can see that. It says scope or die for you live scopers out there. And then it's got the, the TK logo. So I think he got me that because I know that this is the front and then the back has the scope or die. So I just recently put a garment on my boat. So I think this is a as a shallow water fisherman. But what we ordered, so thanks for the, the shirt. But this is the uh, tissue paper. <clears throat> So there is his, what he calls the native gill, which is kind of a cover glide, hand poured resin swim bait, glide bait, and then he pours his own tails and he does his own custom, and this is what he calls the juvie gill that he did. So uh, did you dabble with swim baits at all, Chase? I didn't. I didn't. Um. Again, I dabbled with a, a chatterbait a little bit. I just couldn't get bit at anything moving. Yeah, I was just, I was just talking more in general, not necessarily. Oh, on, all in yeah. Gen, um, yeah, I'll throw them a little bit every now and then, especially yeah. in the fall here coming up. So to me, this is like almost an ideal, like Minnesota swim bait size. Like it's yeah. big enough, I think, to draw a big bite, but not going to deter a two pounder at all. Like this is, let's see what we use as a good frame of reference here. What do we all know what the size of is? Yeah. <clears throat> well, here's like a fat free shad, right? So there, give you frame of reference. So pretty sweet looking bait, kind of excited. Nice to support a, a buddy and uh buy one of his custom baits and uh get kind of a handcrafted kind of one-of-a-kind lure so you want to see it next to the vixen brian <laughs> for those that want to yeah i mean a vixen is like a four inch bait so this is not much bigger so yeah Maybe I'll get out and get to play around with this in the fall yet and see if it's something. It seems like we really, being a cover glide, it's supposed to have a tighter glide. And so I think working it around laydowns, docks, kind of shallower weed clumps, things like that can be pretty good. Let's see what's going on here. Yeah, I've, I've, I last this spring, <clears throat> excuse me, I threw it, I caught one on a glide and I caught some on a mag draft, but it wasn't super consistent. But I would think, I always struggle on lakes that I'm practicing for tournaments on using swim baits. But I think, like when you're out there at hunting camp, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you got no pressure, like that would be the time to play around with swim baits. And I think, you could potentially have a banner day out there and fall in love with swim baits um, on that lake in the right situation. I also think like if you got out there late April, early May on that pre-spawn bite, fishing around shallow boulders and things like that, you could probably do some real damage on swim baits, I would think. Let's see. The pin is in the top. Fish in the southeast. Tam and Eggs says, top five lures to throw in Minnesota right now. So what are the top five lures you're going to throw for the next, let's call it, two, three weeks? Uh, well, obviously a jig. So uh, a three-eighths ounce jig, a half ounce jig, a three-quarter ounce. <laughs> <laughs> And then the same in football. Um, but a jig, a chatterbait, uh, a crankbait, a lipless, 
and then probably a Nedry. Well, the stream's over. He wants to throw a Ned. <laughs> <laughs> um so when you say crankbait like what's like what size or what depth or what uh i'm a big fan of just the you know the warts obviously are great crankbaits kind of that anywhere that targets kind of that six to ten foot range there you go do you like the new warts the old warts or you don't think it matters i i'm not particular enough i should say i know okay. some people definitely so you, 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 you saying you can catch bass on new I'm work? saying I can eat you know, every once wow. in a while a bass will bite a new ward. DT tens are great this time of year. Nice. But you gotta keep a Ned rig ready for smallmouth. Well, I suppose for smallmouth. You gotta have a Ned rig ready for small. Yeah. Um for me it's definitely jig chatterbait. Do I have to list five? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there are times when a buzz bait and a frog can be really good. That That's like a, a short window we have here. Um, the jig and chatterbait will be a lot longer window, but there is some, you got a short window if you can get on some really good frog buzz bait bites um, this time of year. But sometimes it can be literally non-existent and the next day it can be, you know, digging it out of their crushers. So that's kind of a fickle uh, bite. I've struggled with that the last couple of years. A few years, you know, years been the past. I've had a great frog bite this time of year on any of that dead matted up grass along the shore. Mm -hmm. In these last couple of years, it's just been non-existent for me. And actually, Brian and I really tried to force that buzz bait bite in practice, thinking that that should have been a deal. On big, couldn't buy a bite. Yeah. It seems like it would be an amazing buzz bait lake. It seems like it would be a great square bill lake too. I I just I don't know. I I can't get bit on anything moving out there. Hmm. I have to slow down on that lake. Almost every time I've been there, I've been able to find a pretty good chatterbait bite. Usually, yeah. I, I don't know if the areas that I was fishing just had seen enough of them recently or Maybe I was just throwing it funny that day or what, but. Yeah. And then the one time I was there in June, they were eating frogs like it was their job. Really? Like, and they didn't miss. They were <laughs> like, like, you'd like, and it wasn't like, you know, like le fish leech, right? Like where they're I, like, they haven't. I know. I still haven't been up to leech. Okay. Well, in leech, they attack frogs like great whites eating baby seals. Like they like come out over the top and like do crazy stuff. Like Big Stone wasn't like that, but they were very deliberate. Like it was like just like, huh. and then you'd set the hook and it'd be like, like <laughs> gagged on it. Like they never missed. They were super deliberate and it would be like in the roof, top of the mouth, back every time. That's awesome. Like in two days of practice and tournament, I think I missed like one frogfish. Oh, actually, I shook some off, but like it was like, it'd be like, like just. <clears throat> oh, and they dig on that lake too. Yeah. Oh. South Jersey wants to know if you've ever played around with the JDM baits or just like those simple jig square just basic baits stuff you can I'm get a, at i'm a basic bait kind of guy Me meat and potatoes yeah I'll, I'll play around you know i'll take the basic baits and play around with them a little bit but n no you i seem to be able to do you know catch the fish i need to mm -hmm. with the the basics yeah i had a phase in my life where i really like like when Lucky Crafts first came out, you know, a decade ago, I was really into like finding that next cool thing and ordering baits off eBay and getting these little Japanese crankbaits and all that kind of stuff. And but then I realized as a tournament fisherman, the last thing I want to do was like find out that this little thing was the deal <laughs> and then lose it to a pike and then have no confidence that I was going to catch them on the other hundred crankbaits I had in my box because I couldn't replenish that. You know what I mean? So I kind of got away from it. 
I I got into it just to buy them, to be honest with you, because they are pretty. Uh, but more of like a collector's thing. I, I never throw them. Yeah. This is kind of like on the fence for me. Like this is something that I wanted definitely to have, but I do intend to throw this. Unlike this thing, which I got like an original wooden plunker that's never left the box. <laughs> and then I've got this guy. Which I probably should throw. Ooh. <laughs> which is a snack size gill. So I mean I, I definitely have my share of uh collector type baits that I, you know end up being more of a I don't know. Yeah. But I've gotten more away from that where it's like I'm just gonna flip my Vast Tech jig and put a menace scrub or a speed crawl on the back of it and they don't eat that i don't want to catch them that and i just I, the older i get the more i hate playing with treble hooks yeah uh matthew that was an s uh jsj snack size yep the punker i don't know i just i could throw those gills but i just know the punker doesn't like i don't know I just don't have a lot of comments or anything bigger than a Vixen when it comes to the top water. Uh, yeah, these these definitely I don't think require anything super. I think I could throw this on the same rod I throw a Carolina rig on. Honestly, I don't need anything 764, 735, something like that. I don't even think I need to put this on my swim bait rod. <laughs> um other things going on so probably do a member stream i'm probably going to sneak one in sometime this week so you members just kind of keep an eye on uh, i'll probably just throw up one and we'll give away some stuff that we owe you guys on the member stream otherwise let's see we're uh, a little over an hour in if you guys got questions fall fishing um like i'm all about keeping it simple and jigs and big line and getting after it in the fall um, I should have thrown top water on my list too. Yeah, top water can be a lot of fun in the fall. I see a lot of people asking about the punkers. The one thing is we don't have gizzard shad where we live, and I feel like if I lived in a place that had gizzard shad, I'd be more likely to throw that big punker top water. I just don't feel like there's a ton of forage that the bass. Not saying you won't catch them. But to make it like a really strong bite, I just don't know if we have the right forage to make them want to come up and eat that punker. If I lived on a reservoir with gizzard shad, I would be a lot more inclined to throw it. Oh, that's a good point. Are you an FG guy or what's your knot? I'm an FG guy. Do you tie an FG knot in the boat with confidence or is it all just the night before? I do. I, I could do it in the boat with confidence, though, you know, though I tough part is singeing that last little tag end, but no, I, I can tie an FG knot pretty quick now. Nice. I can tie that you, quicker and easier than I can the Alberto knot. So hmm. Interesting. Nope, just a Minnesota license for Big Stone. Top three cranks for the fall. Top three cranks, uh, DT-10, a DT-6, and then um, I really like these black label balsa square bills. Mm -hmm. I think they make a, I think it's called a wreck or a wreck. And I love those. There it is. I love, yeah, I love those square bills. Those are great, great baits. Which they are modeled off <clears throat> the WECs. <clears throat> They're not the same, but that's, I think, the inspiration for those black labels is the old Zoom WEC ones.
But I don't get that. I don't, uh, every once in a while, I show this page. So here's a WEC2. So that's Kevin Shark's signature on it. He won, a, he won at least one tournament off of those, didn't he? A couple. Yeah, I know that Pickwick tournament. I think they both, they play that. <clears throat> I don't know if that exact one, but yeah, the Balsa Square Bills definitely the Pickwick win and his Fort Madison win were both. There were definitely players in both of those. Uh, what's up, Amy? We just, I don't know, we just uh, showed off the Native Gill, and we did uh, show off your handiwork with the Scoper die shirt. I don't know, you, Amy, you can let us know if there's any of these shirts or any of your other shirts up on the Tackle Craft website right now. If people wanted to get their hands on one of those, you could let us know. Um, SJ says, just throw the punker. You'll be surprised. Yep. Wreck and Wreck Jr. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Miles, we kind of talked about this earlier. Uh, it basically was a variety of jigs, three to six foot, rocks, grass. Um, I don't know if there's more details you want to give than that, but that was kind of, I mean, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, it, it's your bit, ba your basic bass looking structure that, you know, you find those long rock, rock stretches and you find those rocks that just kind of stuck out a little bit more along those stretches. So you were looking for the intricacies. Sometimes it was bigger, sometimes, sometimes it was, it was bigger, thicker, sometimes, sometimes it was sparser, sometimes it was, right. You were just looking exactly. for something that looked juicy something, on a stretch. Something that something that changed in that stretch so kind of think of it as like weed line fishing but rock line fishing so you know you're looking for a hole in the grass or you're looking for where it's thicker or where it's thinner or where it turns or where it makes a point or where there's right or exactly exactly um or maybe you're looking for you know, sometimes there'd be no grass or there'd be clumps of grass or there'd be something, but there was always something that made something a little sweeter in an area. Yep. All right. So if you think that scope or die shirt's cool, uh, tacklecraft.com, check them out. Otherwise, they got some other cool shirts. They got better, better dead than Ned um, and a couple other fun shirts out there. <clears throat> Dialog Coastal 2150 kind of a frog and a jig and thing. Yeah, it's a good reel for both of those. Um, I use mine for frog and I also had one that I was trying to chatterbait on. I got two of them now. It's a it's a definitely a good workhorse reel. Um, with a good especially if you like a decent amount of line capacity on your reels. For a 150, it's got a pretty deep spool. No problem with the replay, gang. Frank, thanks for joining in. Uh, Waverly is, it's a good lake. Fish it. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, I've heard that people are running up north now versus before the south end of the islands was the deal. Yeah. Um, I think we're still learning about Big Stone, to be honest. Like, I think there's still things to be figured out on that lake. I, the islands just draw so much attention because it's the most obvious structure when you're looking at a map or just looking at the lake. And then when you go to side image it, there's so much rock going all the way up and down that <laughs> lake. Mm -hmm. That, you know, again, I think people start at the islands and they start working that rock kind of away from those islands. And, you know, the north end of the lake is still 18 miles away. Right. So it's, it's I don't think a lot of people have gotten up there, but there's plenty of fish structure and fish habitat and bait. And <laughs> I was able to catch a few bass up that way and. Telling uh, Rich earlier, I saw a couple other guys running up there. So there are definitely fish up there, and I think it's being discovered more. 
Yeah. And I think there's less, there's not as many ramps up there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and you're and further then, away from town. So it's, it's more of a commitment, whether you drive or whether you go by boat or, um, and honestly, some of the ramps as you go up the Minnesota side are shallow and difficult. <laughs> and like, yep. if you get a Northwest wind, you don't want to use any of those ramps. <laughs> so it's like, uh, it's, uh, it kind of, some of that kind of protects the North end a little bit, I think, um, it is. It's it's definitely further away from any kind of civilization that's out there. Yeah. And I like I know it's kind of know if I, I kind of explained it earlier. I think like to me the bass probably really started to get their foothold in the islands because it is definitely the most bassy classic. You know, it's protected. They've got shallow. They've got deep. They've got boulders. They've got grass. They've got flats. They've got, you know, I mean, like everything they need right there. Right. And uh, I assume, you know, they've had a lot of good spawns, you know, stack up in those islands. And I think now the fish, right, are starting to spread out a little bit. And I think they're going to continue to spread out and start using more of the North End Lake, more of the Minnesota side of the lake. And I, that's part of what makes me think that this lake may still have a little bit to go before it, like, plateaus or declines. But we'll see. I hope it does. Yeah, that'd be exciting. So, um Hopefully we don't hit that dock piling too hard. We don't want to test this that bad. Um, so I guess, yeah, last last uh, call for a few questions. Not going to go too late tonight. Um, the replay will be available on uh, Facebook, YouTube. And uh, search Hello Bass on your favorite podcast app if you want to be. Uh, appreciate the MP3 numbers are growing. People are catching more and more of this on uh uh, MP3, whether they're walking their dogs or driving to the lake, it's a good way to catch up on some of these replays. Yeah, those were the good days, David. The hot pond up to Kegama. <laughs> That's a good question. How do you all locate bass in backwater, specifically pools two and three of the Mississippi, as dead grass for shallow throat the, without much difference in depth? I haven't spent much time fishing this time of year in the backwaters on the river. Um, I guess it would depend if there's bait in there, then I would say there's bass in there somewhere to find. If you're not seeing bait in there, then I would probably come out and fish current adjacent to those areas on the river. Um, prediction, uh, so Chase, you're south, right? I'm I'm a south guy, so I don't somehow we let the pick. north win. So they get to pick. I don't know exactly how the north picks if they have to. I guess I'm not sure. I know the north gets to pick the next lake, but I don't not sure what the process. is. You fish three now, right? So I guess what's the process for the north picking their lake? So I think they'll take the top five teams from the north, and they get to. Like hash it out amongst themselves as to what like we're gonna uh, choose. Okay. So I don't think there's any, you know, they kind of take a list of people's favorites, and I I don't know if they vote on it or. Both times I've managed to, you know, win or place in the top five of these, the North is one. So, ooh, Shane says it's picked. Shane says it's picked. Uh. Best gloves and really cold. I mean, I guess if it's really cold, I like those uh, those wool gloves with the fingers cut off. To me, that's the best thing for cold. Because even when they're wet, wool gloves still retain heat. Um, I'm going to guess, some of you said my speculation, I'm going to say whitefish. I sure hope not. Because <laughs> I feel like wasn't that one that was? Yeah, I think that was where. We, well, I don't know if it can be on Whitefish because they have their cross lake days uh, the same weekend. That's where it was supposed to be this year. I wouldn't be surprised if we're going back to Big Stone. So, did the North win last year? 
Uh, the South won last year. Okay. Uh, what's the last bait purchased on eBay or like not retail? So I guess. <sighs> you ever buy anything off eBay or? Every, no, but basically everything. If I can't find it at Omnia, <clears throat> then I go to Tackle Warehouse. If I can't find it at Tackle Warehouse, then I'll check eBay. <clears throat> um, I feel like I bought some Hildebrandt, the blade spinner baits that they don't make anymore off eBay. Um, hmm. I'm kind of the same way. I've kind of gotten out of that mode of life where I'm not tracking things down on. I think that's probably one of the last things I bought was some Hildebrandt, the blade spinner baits that they don't make. Uh, my all around go to jig is a three eighths ounce or half ounce Bastec tungsten jig and either a black brown green pumpkin or an oaky craw. Five eighths ounce cell fighter jig in the money craw. This is a question earlier. Has the water turned over in our cut part? No, not that no. I've noticed. No, we're probably a couple weeks yet based on our weather patterns. At least like the actual turnover. I think water has to be pretty low to, before it starts doing that. The Vixen came back. Any need to what? Find them on eBay? I don't know. I haven't tried the. I threw the new one a little bit on Vermilion. It sounded right to me, but they weren't on top water, so I really didn't get like tested by the fish. Um, I don't know that I'm still looking, to be honest. I've kind of moved more to the uh, Bassman Compact <laughs> is my new spinner bait mainly. Um, cool. All right. Well. I feel like people have got most of their questions answered. We covered uh, a little bit of fall fishing. I'm sure we'll talk more. Watch for a member stream in the future. Um, appreciate you coming on last minute, Chase. I didn't give you a lot of warning, but uh, glad you could make it. Yeah, well, I appreciate you having me. It's kind of an honor to be on here. Yeah. So yeah, have, you, have you watched a, a replay before or ever tuned in before? I sure have. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Awesome. Well, as always, uh, here to help you guys catch more big bass and suck less.